Gracias a la vida que me ha dado tanto, me dio todo tu cero, que cuando lo sabro, te se... Gracias a la vida que me ha dado tanto, me dio todo tu cero, que cuando lo sabro, te se tu distingo, lo negro del blanco y en el alto cielo. Gracias a la vida que me ha dado tanto, me dio todo tu cero, y cuando lo sabro, verte tu distingo, lo negro del blanco y en el alto cielo, tu fondo estrellado y en la multitud de Sharon que lo amo. Gracias a la vida que me ha dado tanto, me ha dado el sonido y el abecedario con él las palabras que bien y claro, padre, amigo, hermano, y luz alumbrando la ruta del alma del que estoy amando. Gracias a la vida que me ha dado tanto, me ha dado el oído que en todo su año, traba noche y día, críos y ganarios, partido turbina, ladrido su barrio. probably want to sit. Okay, if you're outside and standing, just squeeze in and between people and there are like steps to sit on lower down. All right, you're, you're, can you hear me in the back? Is there anyone who cannot hear me, of course, who's just out of here? All right, um, before we get started, a couple of little uh, details that some of you are very interested in. Um, the enrollment teacher passed out again. I'm giving people three chances to be here uh, before they disappear from the enrolled or the wait list. And you all have brought your bodies here, so you know, you, you've gained a point. Uh, if you've already filled this out, just it's just an attendance sheet, so if you've already written the stuff, you don't have to do it again. We've got your name. Uh, if how many people are, have not been here before? Okay, you want to fill out the whole thing. And I'm delighted to see uh, that there are actually, you look, yes, oh, there's, there's a lot of room over here. So if you guys want to come in that door and come down, there's more room. Um, by the third week, there'll be the decisions about admitting. And that's all I have to say about that. Uh, there's some little things about your reader. If you have looked at it, you need to ignore the first 10 pages. They will confuse you. They are uh, copyright information from Copy Central. They have to do that by law. That's not part of the class reader, per se. Uh, it's page 11 where you get the table of contents that the reader starts. And uh, one of our wonderful TSIs, has, uh, Linda, has gone through and on the course website to get the page numbering for the table of contents. Yes. But the reader is not the same as the Ball 2003 reader. Um, there are some more readings in it. Uh, some readings are rearranged. Therefore, the numbering system is completely different, so the, the other reader won't correspond to the numbers in the syllabus. Plus, we re zero off some of the things that were blurry in the other one. Uh, with a great deal of effort, you could probably make the translation, but you may not want to. And you need to get all the new readings from someone. Are there questions about that or about? Yeah. So, uh, you the yeah, you turn in this one also because we're getting three attendances. It's Copy Central on Bancroft, and that's in your syllabus, if you forget. OK, another uh, legality uh, I'm announcing as required, again, that the class is being webcast. And uh, it apparently is working, because I've already got feedback from uh, two people, and apparently so you can. That the upside for you is uh, you can get the lectures repeated, or if you have to miss one, you can get them that way. Uh, the perhaps downside is that I'll assume that you've got all of them. Okay, let's let's start with today's uh, cheery subject, the life of the Buddha. This is a story, it's a narrative, and it's popular. And it's popular with all kinds of people who don't 
are not interested or care about or even maybe slightly hostile to Buddhism. So why? Well, uh, I mean, I've heard this, this simple little tale of this person's life repeated in the most amazing context, you know, in, in uh, psychotherapy talks and uh, churches and, uh, well, Hollywood has got hold of it for a while and produced a bunch of of Buddha films, and I've seen really grouchy kids whose parents drag them to something when this, you know, someone starts talking this, they settle down and they start listening. And I've heard uh, cynical religious studies professors kind of get enthusiastic when they relate to life as a Buddhist. Uh, so what I think is that it has a kind of deep mythic quality where it touches on some of the basic points that are important to people. And while it's at it, we'll notice, it really turns on its head a lot of our psychology kind of the, the basic idea of human motivation in our present psychology. Now, I'm going to do a little bit of historical background. It's not part of the psychology per se, but it's so interesting that I couldn't contain myself. Okay, uh, India. And uh, India had an indigenous people speaking a Dravidian language uh, who perhaps already had some kind of yoga and meditation going. And at about 16,000 BCE, somewhere in the region of the Danube, a very warlike people arose which historians have called the Aryans, that name didn't have the emotive connotation it has now, uh, who smelted copper weapons and developed uh, a very efficient light three-wheeled war chariot and just came bursting out of their region and started conquering everything. Uh, they spread east and west and north and south, uh, as far west as Ireland. Many of us may be the product of them. And uh, about um, in 15,000 BCE, they started coming over the Hindu Kush mountains. I see there is no obvious stick to point at, but that's in the extreme north west corner of the map of the mountains when they came. And they, you know, conquering everything in their path, and they started coming into India. They had, they were akin, they, they also passed through Greece, so that's your ancient Greeks. They had sky gods, they sang glorious things to them, uh, which is the Rig Veda, and uh, as they moved into India, they were herding people, they settled down, they became farmers, and they gradually developed a caste system. And um, do you think that the uh, people that were already there, they said, oh, hey, we're kind of tired, why don't you rule all this? And well, uh, no, does anyone ever do that? So, um, and by about in 600 BCE, the era when the Buddha was born, there were all kinds of things happening in India. There were huge technological and social changes happening. Iron was smelted. I'm telling you this because it may start to resonate with things going on today. Not that we had to smelt iron, but that meant bigger farms, more efficient production of food, surplus of food, relative leisure. People then began developing what we call culture, or culture, and the anthropologist culture, more efficient weapons, efficient weapons, uh, which meant little kingdoms could conquer the surrounding area, bigger states, taxes, ports, better vehicles, travel, communication, culture, contact, ideas coming all over the place, and kind of their version of an information revolution. People were being displaced, there were refugees all over the place, they were going into cities, and there was lots of upheaval and uncertainty and confusion, and religious ferment, you know, all kinds of questions of what's the meaning of life, what are we doing, is there a life after death, and so what is it like, is there a life before death, and so what is it like, uh, new religions were arising, there were wonders and speakers and debates, formal debates, informal debates, uh, different kinds of meditation proliferating, kind of, you know, we're in a technological revolution, this little gadget, you know, all that, uh, when I came here, no way. Uh, when I first came here, the main entertainment was people would bring their animals to class, and the dogs would run up in front, and you know, dogs they get together, and, and the class would start laughing, and I turn around. Yes, the dogs are. Uh, now we have our sort of modest version of MTV, and this is uh, in the 60s, 70s, Telegraph Avenue, a frequent kind of site, somewhat I, I would imagine mirroring what was going on in that period all over this, uh, this country, with you know the Ganges being navigable the way our Telegraph Avenue was at the time. Uh, actually, this, don't get hooked on this. This is a group that uh, was in the 13th century uh, AC, so but you get the flavor maybe. So it's into this kind of ferment that uh, the person we now call the Buddha, which is a title, you know, the awake one was born. And uh, he was born in the foot of the Himalayas, or Himalayas, pronounced as you will, in what's now Nepal. And here we start the, uh, the mythic story. So he's the son of a king. Have you ever noticed that in these kinds of stories, the, last, the hero is either the son of a king or of a really poor woodcutter, beggar, carpenter, you know? And we're going to see that theme unfolding. And right after he's born, as was the custom, then a sage comes to do an augury about the future. If you saw the Lion King, remember the little fur ball is born, and what happens? The sage comes to him, jumping up and down, and gives it, uh, says things about him. Uh, one reason why that film was popular is not to be specific issues. And the sage says, well, this is a very special child. He's either going to be a world ruler, or a great religious leader, great spiritual leader. 
and his father, the king, says, oh, well, we have to make sure that he becomes a world ruler and doesn't get caught up in any of those cults, right? So, and his father, the king, so he can do something about this. He makes sure that the Buddha never sees anything in the world that's going to head him in the direction of the spiritual or giving up his kingly life and not being a world ruler. So he makes the ultimate protected environment, and because this is a very special child, the Buddha gets along great in this. All right, time for you to think. What didn't you have when you were growing up that you wanted? Okay, this is a big question. Or what did you have that you might have had some more of? Did you ever look in the mirror and say, oh, it's a bad hair day? Or, I'm fat. <laughs> well, he was beautiful, yes. Freedom from chores. Freedom from chores. Okay, he's the son of a king. He's got servants everywhere. No chores. Yes. Stability. Perfectly. He's the son of a king. He never goes outside the palace. As far as he, everything is perfectly stable. There are no invasions. I mean, he's got, yes. Meaning. Meaning, purpose. Complete meaning, purpose. He's the son of a king. He knows just what he's going to do. He's going to be the next king. He's being brought up to do that. He's being trained in all the arts. He's being taught. This is a supremely important thing. Yes. Real friends. As real friends as opposed to imaginary friends. <laughs> okay, yes, he's got real, see, he's very sociable, you know, outgoing. Why not? Uh, so he's got, you know, his, the king has many ministers, and they have children, and he's being brought up by, you know, with all these friends, and they have athletic competitions, and they're pretty good too, but he's very good, and they admire him, and, you know, lots of friends. Yes? Something different, the variety of They bring, they, they know about that, so. <laughs> they, they keep bringing him new things anytime he looks a little, you know, I'm bored, are we there yet? Why can they come with new stuff, new games, new toys, new whatever, athletic competitions? He excels. Uh, learning the sword and the, the weapons, he excels. Yes? Well, did you, did, you, <laughs> did you think about that as a young child? <laughs> okay, well, we'll get back to that. <laughs> yes. Travel. Well, it's a big palace run. <laughs> he gets to travel to different things. Yes? Uh, to see things outside the palace. Well, the world that he's brought up in is there's nothing to see out there. I mean, did you really want to stick your head in the garbage can when you were little? And, uh, maybe. <laughs> um, all right, now he's getting to reach adolescence. Yes. <laughs> Women, okay. Well, okay, now there's room for, okay, we've gotten this far and everything's okay. Um, but now we have the possibility of this switching into the Romeo and Juliet myth. But it doesn't. He falls in love with and she with him. The daughter of his father's chief minister, a perfectly, you know, a, a demure, beautiful, fits exactly into the cultural stereotype uh, of, of the perfect match. The parents are delighted. They get married. Okay, now, he's a young newlywed. And given the era, the ter next terrible thing that could happen is no heir. You know, will she have children? Or horrors, will she have a daughter? Well, she gets pregnant right on time and produces a beautiful, healthy son. So. The man who had everything in perfect life, except some of you have already thought about what might happen, which is he's not happy. Okay, it's not enough. He wants to find out what's across the way over those walls that he's been living inside of. And he insists he wants to go out of the palace grounds and state and go to the city. And so he nags, and finally his father says, all right, and then his father sends out orders to the city, all right, clean up everything. As, you know, if there's certain places in our cities, if you walk around and you don't look quite right, somebody